Well, we are going through the book of Mark. And as we drive through this book, um, verse by verse, section by section, we see something that's so outstanding, what our Lord put together here through the author of Mark. And, you know, when I think about the words of Jesus often and study his words a lot, and they fascinate me as they should, and the Lord told us to read through what he has written. And, you know, when we do this, I don't know, sometimes every, I will find myself seeing something that I've never seen before all the time this happens. And I'm like, man, I have read through Mark. I, was, I will read the passage of study every day for the week prior to, and I've already read through it before, but I'm reading it again every single day just to see what I, I you know, if the Holy Spirit reveals different things to me that I'm not seeing before. Uh, every week I'm blessed by peeling back the layers of this onion. There's always something more that you discover when you read the word. I'm doing a seven-time read-through of Deuteronomy right now. I'm on time number four. This is a concerted effort to see things that you don't see before, and um, it's a study thing that I wanted to do. So I read Psalm. Right now I'm in Psalms and Colossians and Luke, but I've been reading Deuteronomy separately every single day, and I will not stop until I get through it seven full times. And every time I read it, there's something else that I didn't see. The, and I'm like, there's no, there's no way this is continuing to happen. But it's what the Holy Spirit is revealing to you and I when we read the text. Likewise, when we see what Jesus said in the Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the Gospels, we always find something new. One thing that sticks out to me that I don't know that has always stuck out to me is John 14, 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. I've seen that before. But it resonates with me. It resonates with me because I'm like, if I love him, I will keep his commandments. Well, then that moves us to this. Well, what are the commandments? Well, what is he mean? What is he meaning here? Which ones? Are the Ten Commandments only? Well, that's a good question. We have to go through this, and we will in a moment. What we're going to see the Lord tell us is the most important commandment, the great, known as the Great Commandment, and then we will be able to revisit that. John 14, 15 passage at the end to summarize it. The key to our learning today is to get a broader picture of what we must hold fast to. And I say that because let me explain something to you. If you call yourself a Christian, you can't be ignoring his instruction manual. It's got to be open, and you've got to be learning. A lot of people go, yeah, I read it, and I don't, I don't always get it. Okay, no problem. I don't know what to read. When I read it, my eyes get heavy. I don't know why every time I'm reading it, I get sleepy. Who do you think's behind that? You watch TV, you ain't getting sleepy. Well, unless you're Shelly. Shelly, you're not the only one who gets heavy-eyed when watching television. My point is, there's a lot of people who will make excuses for why they won't read the gospel. The point is, is that we got to find a way to inspire you to do it, encourage you to do it. That's why we've got Bible studies. I had a brother in the church reach out to me. He had some questions, had a lot of questions. We sat down Friday with our words open in a coffee shop and just talked about the gospel for an hour. And then we had a moment of apologetics that will be another day, another time. But I love that. Anytime you want to sit down with any, myself or the elders, we'll make time. If you are trying to figure out how to read this, we've even got pamphlets of how to understand your Bible. So, so when you read it, when you read it, you'll understand the backside of it. So like if you're like, I'm not ready to read Malachi. This little pamphlet tells you Malachi, the author, it's one page. Or to the you know, front and back side page of a little pamphlet. Who's the author, when it was written, why it was written, the purpose. That's it. And it helps to then read the book and you're like, okay, well now I understand the context, at least mostly. We got them. We'll hand them to you. They're free to you. Get excited about the gospel, folks. If you call yourself a Christian, you cannot 
leave this closed on a shelf somewhere. That's asinine. If we're following Jesus Christ, we have to learn. to Now, now that will segue right into our lesson today. Because sometimes you go, but I don't have a desire yet. We can work with that. Let's show you how. But first, let's pray together. Lord, as we gather together today, we're going to investigate the second half of the book of Mark, chapter 12. The, the second half of the chapter. Lord God, as we continue to expository, uh, exp expositorily preach, Lord God, through the book of Mark, we ask you, Lord Jesus, that you would just please let us see the words that are in front of us. That you would open our eyes to see what your word says and open our ears to receive it. Write your words upon our hearts, Lord. This is all for us to, um, to extract, to eat, to take and read, and to help us understand who you are, who you really are. We ask you, Lord God, to please help us to put aside anything that we're thinking of that, that, get us, that gets in our way right now for the next half hour. Let us just focus on you, focus on your scripture, focus on what is going on here in the book of Mark, and walk away from this with a better understanding. Now, I humble myself before your throne, and I ask you, Lord God, to remove me and use me as a, as a mouthpiece, Lord God, as a vessel to preach your gospel, but may I not get in the way of your spirit moving through this place, your word going forward. May your word go forward and never return void. And Lord Jesus, may your spirit go before us in this, this morning in the message. We ask all this in your precious name, Jesus, and we ask you to be glorified on this day. Amen. Mark 12, 28 through 44, would you please stand with me, get your blood flow going as we read the introduction to this through verse 34. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another and seeing that he had answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? And Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and there is no one other besides him. No other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Praise God for the reading of his word. You may be seated this morning. Man, I love this. I love this. I love this because I love what the Lord is saying here. It is as important, vitally important that, that he is being asked, well, what's the most important? Important commandment. And he's telling you and I right here. And not only that, but the scribe says something that's full of wisdom. And Jesus commends him on it. So we're going to talk about that in a second too. But first of all, let me give you a little back, backdrop here. You'll hear phrases sometimes from the pulpit when we're teaching through the word of God. It's like Pentateuch. And you're like, okay. Well, the Pentateuch is the first five books of the Bible. Who was the author of those? Good job. Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. Those are the five books. They're called the Pentateuch. Penta, five, okay? The Torah, you hear that word sometimes. That encompasses all of the law of God in the Old Testament, okay? Torah means law of God, and within the Torah, there are 613 commandments. Wow. 613. It's 365 are negative in form. You shall not. Meanwhile, 248 are positive. You shall. The lay person, the unbeliever, somebody who doesn't understand anything about what we're Supposed to be teaching from a pulpit in a church. 
is that we don't understand when we pick up and we read a very difficult law in Leviticus that we think that that's how Christians are supposed to perform things now. Quit watching TikTok <laughs> with the morons to get your theology, folks. So let me explain something to you. The Torah was both a blessing and a curse. John talked about it this morning. The Red Sea parted. Don't care if you still struggle with that or not. Not up for debate. It happened. It's been proven to happen with archaeological digs. Even to prove the point, I believed it before I even knew that. The Red Sea parted. The land dried. They walked through it. As soon as they got through, Moses turned around and bam. And they did. Israel saw this. This monumental miracle. And it's a couple weeks later, they're complaining. Days later, they're complaining about what they're eating. And a couple weeks later, they're complaining because Moses hasn't got back from going up Mount Sinai yet. And they make a golden calf to worship. Because we are H-U-M-A-N knuckleheads. We are human. We are human and we want to be microwaved now. I want a Oompa Loompa now, Daddy, and I want it, <laughs> right? It's a microwave society. We want, we want immediate gratification, satisfaction, and that is not the way God operates. Amen. You know, we learned last week this word patience. The virtue of Christianity is patience. It's one of the nine fruit of the Spirit it is not up to you when you get what you want. And you get enough of what you want. If I want a double blended mocha from Scooters, I'm running down the street to get me a large double blended, now sugar free, mocha from Scooters. That's my jam. But anyway, you know, we have things that we want like this and we get it. But not everything in life can be like that. And we have to learn that the fruit of the Spirit is something that we must emulate. And patience is one of those things. The nation of Israel was not patient. They were defiant, much like us. We, too, are like this. But we have a God that forgives us of that. When I think about these crazy commandments of the Old Testament makes us wonder about exactly where God was going here. Because of that worship of that golden calf, they got punished. Could have all been dead. He was ready to wipe them off the planet. Moses appeals on their behalf. Only some of them die. Then they get cursed with all these extra laws. Fine. You don't want to trust me? You're going to be punished. That's why they're in there. That's why the Torah exists. However, there are things within the Torah that are important to look at especially the Ten Commandments. We know the Ten Commandments are really important. Not a single one of them are absurd. Not like stoning your kids when they, get, they go crazy on you, right? Taking your wife out to, to death, public execution if she commits adultery. Things like this, clearly. You could tell their punishment laws of the old times. That's not something we practice today. Thank you, Lord, for your sacrifice so we don't have to. Because that's what it amounts to. When we look at the Ten Commandments, so Jesus is asked, what's the most important? Love the Lord God. He quotes Deuteronomy 6, and actually it's in Deuteronomy 11 too. It's a recapitulation in Deuteronomy 11, the great commandment, the greatest commandment. The, what is, is important? The Ten Commandments and the great commandment. The great commandment is to love God. Jesus brings all this together. The creedal form of Judaism brings it together to them to explain, love God, love your neighbor. Love God, love your neighbor. They are distinguishable and not separable. You cannot love God and hate everybody. They may annoy you, but you cannot hate them. And you cannot love people and hate God. It is not possible. He is telling you that you must love God. Now, this is the beautiful thing. 
This brings together the Ten Commandments and one beautiful summary from Jesus. If you love God, you think about the first five of the Ten Commandments. No other gods before him. No graven images. Do not take his name in vain. Honor the Sabbath. Honor your mother and father. You love God, that's an emulation of it. Amen. The second is to love your neighbor as yourself. Do not steal, do not murder, do not lie, do not commit adultery, and do not covet people, other people's property, other people's spouses, other things. Don't envy that happens, those five, when you love your neighbor. Because you're not going to kill somebody. You're not going to steal from somebody. You're not going to covet their stuff or commit a You know what I mean? Yes, you may certainly fall into these. And all of us have committed an abhorrent amount of, of grievous acts against these Ten Commandments. You know, you may not have physically killed somebody, but you thought about killing somebody in your head. You committed sin in your heart. You hate them and you state you hate them. Jesus says you might as well have killed them. And that's hard for us to think about. We're like, well, I didn't pick up a gun and shoot somebody. Doesn't matter. You hate them here. When you love God, you honor those first five. When you love your neighbor, you honor the second five. That's the Ten Commandments. Jesus summarized it perfectly. Now notice the second thing here is the scribe responds with basically, yes, Lord, you are right. And encounters with some, some flat out wisdom. Jesus says, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Notice that. You are not far from the kingdom of God. Now, here's what's interesting about that. Yes, you're getting it. You're close. But how does not far defer, for, from, defer from you're there? Well, you're on the threshold of salvation. But it has never been a personal figuring it out. It made sense one day because the Holy Spirit gifted you faith for salvation because that is what grace does for you and I. And then we are moved to repent and believe in him. We're, we're moved to, to our moment of justification or regeneration and we, we have a second birth. We're like, I'm so sorry, Jesus, that I've, I've been a sinner. I love you. I want to follow you. That, that, that time where it just all just comes together. It's a beautiful moment of your life. For some of you, it hasn't occurred yet, and we will be praying that it does. But there are moments like this, and the way it happens is through understanding of seeing that, oh, okay, Jesus, you're pointing to what I understand. I get, I'm getting what you're throwing down. And Jesus says, good job. You're not far from the kingdom of God. Now, we heard nothing more about this scribe, and we don't need to know nothing more about it. But don't be surprised if we, uh, you know, after the, the, the crucifixion a couple of days later and the well-documented, well, -documented, well uh, you know, it's the top story of the resurrection because other people resurrected at the same time. Another day, another story for that one. It's in scripture. Jesus resurrects. He defeats death. And he appears to almost 600 people over 40 days. Come on, man, you get one person seeing, witnessing a crime, that person goes to, goes to jail. If it's credible, you get two, they done. 600, amen? I'll bring this up constantly because people are like, I don't know, I said, Jesus, I don't know if he really, 600 people witnessed the, I witnessed the resurrection. That's astounding, astounding. But it's the biggest news of the day. Now, now don't, don't fret here. What happens if the scribe? Well, we don't know, but don't be surprised if we don't get into the presence of our Lord and he, I don't know, and ask him, like, hey, Lord, what happened to that scribe? It's right here. And after he saw what happened to me, after he saw the resurrection, he broke as he realized that what he had noticed was truth. He sought after the truth. He did. He's looking. He was like, Jesus is on to something here. I know y'all don't like him, but he's on to something here. And, and, you know, and that scribe one day was like, I can't, I can't keep doing the things I'm doing. He's the Messiah. Hell no. 
But don't be surprised. We don't know. But don't be surprised. Look, you guys, we, we don't know what our, our, our seed does that we throw down. We never know. We don't know the impact. My buddy Barry White lives in, not the singer. <laughs> but Barry lives in Washington, and I tell the story once in a while. But Barry, you know, I, I planted seeds with him. You know, he paid no attention. He, he listened, but then I'd go to pick him up for church, and he would, I'd be knocking on that door, and he wouldn't answer. You know, pretty soon he just quit hanging out with me. I was too, getting too religious for him. Then here's, you know, the only good thing about the landfill known as Facebook is that about nine years ago, I reached out and found him. We talked, and I said, how you doing, man? And uh, he was like, brother, I want to tell you thank you. Um, you did plant seeds. Don't think that your work was all in vain. You know, I just wasn't ready, but the Lord brought me to him later. I'm going to praise God, you know? So we don't know, right? But I tell that story because you don't know the work you're doing. I am my good friend, CJ. My best friend, since I moved here, I moved here. He was the first kid I met, 1983, when I moved here from California. I've known the guy for 41 years. After I became a believer, I planted seeds, planted seeds, planted seeds. He quit hanging out with me, too. And then one day, a guy I work with, works. he's like, hey, did you know CJ? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know him really well. He's like my brother from another mother. Yeah, he, uh, he became a believer this weekend at our church. And at the time, I wasn't going to church, so I was like, razzle, frazzle, frazzle, frazzle. I was like, <laughs> you know, like, like as if I was the one that had to get the points scored, you know, in heaven. I'm rejoicing. It wasn't lost. He, it had to come at a time where Jesus revealed it to him. The Holy Spirit gave it to him, the faith in Christ, because it comes from God. It's a gift of God. But it's got to be preached we don't know when these things are going to have this effect. So, so when you see the scribe, be encouraged that, that he was beginning to see it, even if it hadn't completely made sense with him yet. Your work is not in vain, Christian. Your work is never in vain. Whose son is the Christ? And as Jesus taught in verse 35, he said, How can the scribe say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself and the, Spirit, and the Holy Spirit declared... The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. So how was he his son? And the great throng heard him gladly. Okay, this is a confusing one for a lot of believers. Because if you don't know who King David is, he was the second king of Israel. He was preceded by Saul, followed by Solomon. Saul was the first king. David was the second. His son Solomon was the third. Okay? Saul was a mess. Solomon was amazing for a while. Then he became a mess. Really made things bad for the land of Israel. Right in the middle of that, even David had a big sin to his notch of his credit. But David repented. David repented of a horrible thing that he did in the middle. But what did David love? He loved God. In fact, it said that he was after God's own heart. Listen to the words this morning. He's after God's own heart. That's a trip. Because I'm like, how, how are you after God? How, how, what does that look like? What would, what would be after God's own heart? It's falling in love with Jesus. I believed for many years, but I wasn't surrendering to Christ until that moment came where I was like, can't do, I can't have one foot in the grave in the world and one over here with the Lord. I got to make the decision. Do I serve the world? I tried. That failed me. He's never failed me. I blame him because this one fails me. But maybe it's time I stop doing that and start serving him 100%. And that's when I decided to jump on that train and took that that it is really kind of a leap of faith, but that's not salvation. I was already a believer. I'm taking, taking that moment where I'm like, all right, I'm all in. I can't do the world anymore. So I'm going to learn how to love you. And I'm going to do my best to surrender into you. And I'm going to let you change me. And he makes you adapt where you can still enjoy things in the world, but you're not serving the world. 
Christian, you can enjoy things in the world, but not be of the world. And we're not supposed to be. We're in the world. We're not of the world. We're of God. And we can't serve both the world and God. And many of us do that our whole life. We're straddling this fence. We get up on this picket fence. There's the world. There's God. And we're like, man, if I could just, I don't want to go full bore over there. Eh, it's a religious thing. But it's not. The world will make this seem like, look, because you've met radical religious people in, the, in your life before, that's not super... The super religious radical people put Jesus Christ on a cross, y'all. We forget that. Jesus re recognizes the people and states the people, applauds the people who are beginning. Oh, he's had nothing good to say about any of the scribes. We're going to see that in a second. But this one scribe says, hey, Lord, what's the, what's the greatest command? Jesus answers it and he goes, yeah, yeah, Jesus, that's what I'm saying. It's like, there's hope for you yet, man. He's still talking to a scribe. In a second, he makes them all look like m m morons. But we're not there yet. He talks about David. Now, notice Mark notes after, and after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. He calls our attention, that is Mark, to Christ having not only shut down those who tried to trap him, but having answered them so perfectly that then they didn't have any words to say. That does not mean, however, the question and answer sessions are over. We see that in a moment. Instead, Jesus goes in the temple. He takes his rightful place of authority inside the temple because the temple is where you go to worship God. Jesus is God incarnate. He walks into the temple and he begins to school them by asking questions of these opponents, these Uber religious opponents. Jesus said the scribes missed the mark in calling the Messiah the son of David. He was not saying the title itself was inappropriate. He himself is the Messiah and the son of David. And what does that mean? What he's saying is that the scribal understanding of what it means to be the son of David and the Messiah was inadequate. Look, have you ever heard this term before, Davidic king? Okay, son of David, you heard that before? Okay, um, last week uh, we heard the, the great teaching about the son of man, and we heard that, and what does it mean? It means the son of mankind, right? We have some great teachers in this, in this church. I was blessed by that one. But this view was, as it remains to be seen, uh, inadequate because the Jews are thinking that they're going to get a man as king. Jesus was man. 100% man. And he's 100% God. And a lot of people will look at that and they're like, how can, how can a dude be 100% God and 100% man? The study of this is called the hypostatic union. <coughs> Sorry. Told you, random cough. I had some time to time. Hypostatic union. That's a $25 word, right? But these are our understandings of Scripture. This is what study of Scripture does. If we understand that Christ is 100% God and 100% man in one, that's an essential doctrine because it, it makes you understand that Jesus is in deity. He is God in flesh. If we think, you know, it's like I heard that wonderful lady um, in Texas, her husband has that big church and her herself gets up there, her first name's Gloria, and she goes, you know, God looked down at Jesus and said, he's such a good man that he blessed him and anointed him to be the son of God. B blasphemy. Because Jesus is God in the flesh. He is both, he was always with, the world was made through him and for him. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We might not get our mind around the Trinity, the triune God of one God, three persons, co-equal, co-eternal, but that doesn't render it wrong. It wrong. It's, it's right. Without the understanding that our God is triune in nature, is an essential pillar of our faith. 
if you deny that, you have a problem. Now, you can work through that. So if you're still struggling, pray that God reveals this to you, and you're going to read that in Scripture. And you're thinking, well, how is it triune? Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Three and one. And then we're like, well, what about this hypostatic union, this 100% God, 100% man? Let me, let me explain something. It might help you a little bit. There's a moment earlier in this book that we went through last year. And it was where Jesus is in the wilderness. And because he's 100% man, he is really hungry after 40 days. And I told first service this. I said, I can't imagine. Now, I would like to think that no matter what I go through, I will withstand never, ever turning my back on the Lord. Ever. And I believe that my love for him, I want to believe that I would never, ever do that. Come on. There's always a human part that if I tell you that I could, would definitely never do it, you're like, yeah, but would you? That's a question all of us have to answer inwardly. But I would rather... I would rather drown or get burned to death than I would starve to death. I like to eat. I'm just being honest and transparent. I struggle, I struggle with fasting, but I've done it, but I don't do well with it, which is why those moments of fasting were very important to me because God really spoke to me when I finally did it. But what, what the question is here is that what are you willing to do for your Savior? How far are you willing to go for your Savior? And I think about this because I think, man, I don't know. You know, maybe, maybe you know, you'd rather, maybe you'd like, you know, I could starve to death. I, I have no problem with that. I don't want to drown. Maybe you're different from me. I know that. the question is we don't want to discuss these things, and it's not up for discussion. It's up for you to think about a little bit for two reasons. One is how far will you go for your Savior? Will you take death for him? The second thing is, let's look at the humanity in order to understand the godliness of Christ Jesus. Because after the end of 40 days, he is starving. Satan shows up and tempts him three times, three times. He makes everything look delicious and really tasty. That's the human temptation of Jesus. That is where he gets us. But where he does not appeal to the humanity is that because he's 100% God, he's able to say, I rebuke you, Satan. Goodbye, sir. That's what makes him God. Amen. That's what makes him 100% God. Beware of the scribes. And in his teaching, he said, beware of the scribes who walk, like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feast who devour widows as houses for a pretense make long prayers they will receive the greater condemnation they will receive the greater condemnation man if they had burn cream invented at this point they would all have to be applying it amen <laughs> seriously though what a deeper meaning of this direct hit in their religious battleship. You can act religious all day and twice on Sunday. You can put on this facade, but if your heart ain't right, it doesn't matter. And we know this to be true because we see this with our culture itself. Some people who were not scribes dressed themselves up as scribes to convince wealthy widows that they we're going to give the money to the temple. And they get around the corner, they take off the scribe robe, and they run off with the dough. And other times, you know, uh, they were, these scribes were so highly respected in the first century, they put on this crazy facade, and most of the time they were just keeping the money. But Jesus had harsh, harsh words for such unscrupulous characters. He said, I condemn those greater than those who are not like that. You know, their religion was all too often merely a show. Long prayers were offered, long robes were worn in an attempt to prove their piety. But that's not what the Lord is looking for. He's not looking for religiosity. He's looking for a heart that loves him. He's looking for a heart that loves him. Are you willing to love him 
above all other things today. Because a lot of people will say, well, yeah, I love God. But then they step over here and they go, but I really like my job more. And I really love my wife and I, or my girlfriend or my boyfriend or husband or whoever you are. Or you say, oh, but I love my kids. How can I love God above my kids? I love my kids. I'm responsible for them. I really like the job I have. I really like my car. I really like my stuff. Well, this I remind you that the same thing occurred with the rich young ruler when he walked up and he was like, Lord, I, I've kept all my, your commands. I've loved you. And Jesus says, I know you have. Get rid of all your stuff and follow me. I can't do that. Question for you today to answer yourself today. How much do you love him? How much do you love him? He's not asking you to get rid of everything. He's not asking you to be somebody you're not. He's not asking you. He's asking you to fall in love with him. He'll change you from the inside out. That's fact, Jack. Amen? This phenomenon is nothing new. The true church has taken many shots because of all the things that have gone on in the secular world, in the, in the church world. We have people who, secular people and other people who've been to church and they no longer will come to church because they think that everything they see on CBN, TBN, or Daystar or Inspiration Network is what we believe. No, no, no. I don't know how much you give and I'm never gonna know. Don't care. That's between you and God. Let me show you how it's between you and God. The widow's offering in verse 41 through 44. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came in and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciple to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they, for they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all that she had to live on. Folks, he's after your heart. It's not about how much you give. It's about how much you give of this. You know, this lady gives in two copper pennies that equal a penny. That was one thirty-second of a day's wage. Day's wage. Think about that. One thirty-second of a day's wage is all she had. <laughs> You're thinking, well, well, how much sense does that make that she gives in two copper coins that make a penny if that's all she had? How, why would you give that to God? Well, that woman trusted God. And you don't know how she's going to get blessed by that afterwards. This is true fact of Scripture. The problem is televangelists will tell you, you got to give all you have and you go into debt to make sure that God's kingdom grows. And that's how you're going to become a millionaire. Where do you find that in the scripture? Do you read that here? No. It's after your heart. That's what you give is between you and God. What my family gives is between me and God, us and God. Amen? I'll tell you how much I don't even know how much you give. I don't even know what my wife gives. Because she's the one that writes the check or gets online and gives or whatever. Yeah, I, I ask her. She tells me. But I just, you know, I trust her. Sometimes I'm like, you're going to give that? Okay, I'm sorry. That's what the Lord laid on your heart. <laughs> Don't need to know. You need to know what you give, not only if monetary, monetarily, but what you give of your service unto God. That's the big thing. How much are you dedicated to him? <laughs> Amen? I always like bringing up money in church because everybody kind of like sits on the edge and they get a little bit tighter in their chair. And I'm like, don't worry, I'm not going to... I'm not going to go any weird way with you. That's between you and the Lord. But God has blessed this church family, and we continue to do the work, and we're very transparent. Why? Because we need to be. Amen? And this woman was transparent because she walked into a place where there was a coin box. Women and men could walk into it, and everybody saw who walked up, and they could pretty much guess what you threw in there by the clanking of the coins together. And the woman gave all she had. And he goes, brothers, come here. Did you see that? She's got nothing. She gave from here. That's what matters. Not how much she gave, what she gave from. And you do those things because you love the Lord. That's what changes everything. In conclusion, I want to bring back up John 14, 15 today. The one that we began with. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Our Lord wants our love. When we get this right, we get a lot more right in our life than when we don't, than we won't. 
We got to love God first. Jesus taught abundantly. And I want to finish with this. I wrote a, I want to st- I wrote a story about this, and it's going to be in the next newsletter, so I'll let you read that. If you, uh, We have a newsletter that gets sent out every other month. If we have your address, you should get one. If you've not got one, make sure you write your address on one of those yellow cards, and we'll make sure you get it. If not, we have them here, but we'd like to let you have it. It's got a lot of upcoming events for the next two months, a little bit of retrospect. I wrote an article, and I'll save it for that. But I will tell you this, because it surfaced a lot. There's a commercial that, that, that popped on during the Super Bowl that a lot of people have asked questions about. Now, I'll just, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna narrow this down for you. I'm a believer. I love hearing Jesus' name get glorified, right? I love it when, remember when Evander Holyfield took out Mike Tyson? Anybody remember that? And he gave all credit, all glory to Jesus Christ, right? Got his ear bit off through time too. Uh, C.J. Stroud, second pick of the draft. He gives all glory to Jesus Christ. What a great kid, right? There's a lot of people in the, in, the, in, in the world, and they do that. We're like, man, thank you, Lord. But somehow we're willing to throw away the right Jesus just because he gets mentioned. That's a problem, folks. I will say this. Jesus is the name above all names. He needs no commercial, and he needs no four seasons of television show streamed on Angel Studios to be glorified. If you want to know more about Jesus, you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And you'll get to meet him one day, and you really get to know him because you're going to be with him for the rest of eternity. When he says, if you love me, keep my commandments, it means keep your love pure for him. He'll change you from the inside out As far as the commercial goes, I love hearing Jesus' name mentioned. But here's what he wants. He does get you right where you're at. And then he expects you to change out of your sin. Out of your sin. You cannot stay there, Christian. Yes, it's a lifelong process, but you've got to begin by doing what he commanded you deny yourself pick up your cross and follow me that is what he asks us to do if we got what we deserved well let's see Sodom and Gomorrah a flood the soon coming wrath of God I believe him he accepts you where you're at Expects you to change. Let's pray to him. Lord, (laughs) you don't need any advertising. You don't need anything but glorified. You are perfect in all your ways. And here you, you loved, you loved so much. You loved the lady who had nothing and gave up. You loved the scribe who was beginning to actually see it. You know, you, 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 you taught us to love you, love our neighbor. And then we understand that those Ten Commandments are absolutely applicable. You never came to abolish them, but you showed us that the focal point was to love you and love neighbor. That's the great commandment. And out of that, we begin to fall in love with you, and we begin to turn our hearts towards you. And from that, Lord Jesus, you are perfect in all your ways. Perfect in all your ways. Always have been, always will be. We are not perfect, but we can chase after you and ask for you to make us more like you and less like our worldly self. If anybody today, Lord Jesus, has never repented and believed, today is the day of salvation. May they turn away from their sins, deny themselves, pick up the cross, and follow you. It starts by surrendering to you. If anybody has done that today, Lord God, let them share it with us and we will pray with them. Love them and show them that we care for them. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen.